All right, my friends, we are back. Overcome Babylon is live, and we are talking about a very interesting topic today with a very special guest whom I'll introduce in just a moment. 2024, the year of the Leviathan. This is something that is going to be discussed in detail. If you're not familiar with the concept of Leviathan, yes, it's biblical. It's right here. And one, one of the places you see this concept of Leviathan is Isaiah 27, verse 1. In that day, the Lord, yod heh vav -He, Yehovah, with his severe sword, great and strong will, punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent, Leviathan, that twisted serpent, and he will slay the reptile that is in the sea. But we're not there yet. We're not quite there yet, my friends. There's a lot of stuff that needs to happen before God redeems his people, protects his people in a miraculous way, like the the demon, this this thing called Leviathan being slayed. That's that's in the future. First, we got to deal with this situation. And we've been talking about this just like there are four gospels in the Bible. Uh, I know there's more, right? There's anecdotal things and other things that weren't necessarily canonized, but there are four gospels in our Bible, right? Matthew to John, and I have brought on four witnesses. I brought on Lorenzo Garay. <laughs> Sorry, brother, I butchered your last name. Lorenzo Garay to talk about the Aleph Tav eclipse omens, the three solar eclipses over the United States from 2017 to 2024. Then I had Jeff Fletcher on, and we talked a little bit about why is this crossing over Little Egypt, San Antonio, and why is it crossing over Oregon the way that it is? Then we talked more about the New Madrid fault line. What does this mean for America? What does this mean for a future? And it really, that was just me kind of breaking it down. So between me, Jeff, and Lorenzo, we had already broken a lot of ground, I think, on this topic. But I'm about to bring somebody here who's been studying these eclipses of 2017. Like I said, 2023 and 2024. He's been looking at these things before a lot of us were even awake to the fact that this, these are prophetic omens. Cyrus has been studying these things for five years or more. I believe he told me over five five years in, in a private conversation we had together. So with that being said, welcome, Brother Cyrus Harding. Cyrus, how are you tonight? Doing very well. Thank you, Abraham, for having me on. And thank you so much. Seriously, it's a huge honor to have you here with us, spending time. And uh, it's been a while, right? We, we've at, You've actually been on the podcast twice. Almost a year, I think. <laughs> Go ahead and, and just tell everybody a little bit about yourself. Well, when I was in boot camp uh, in the very early 70s, uh, I was recruited by NSA to be a linguist and analyst. And uh, at that time, uh, we were winding down in Southeast Asia. I served uh, until uh, 75 and we evacuated. And then I was... Uh, I wanted to go into Hebrew, was scheduled to go into Hebrew, but I was selected to go back and look for MIA POWs. And uh, we finished that training. And then when we came back after the Christmas break, we were told, nope, you're all going to be Arab linguists. So I became an Arab linguist in uh, 1976 and uh, worked in the Middle East for four years, worked as an analyst, uh, translator, linguist, uh, just many task that the government gives you in, in any particular field. And in the course of doing uh, the work I was given, I also had to learn Aramaic. And I didn't understand why I had to learn Aramaic. But uh, it is evident to me now, after having done a study in the book of John and Aramaic, why I learned Aramaic. It's, it's just unbelievable. Uh, how much our our scriptures have been corrupted by bad translation. Mm -hmm. Amen. And we've talked a little bit about that privately. Now, guys, if you want to check out more of Cyrus's work, please visit his blog. He has it on screen underneath his name, but it's codgerville.wordpress.com. Um, and the, the reason I brought him on is because he's talking about, he just posted this a few days ago, and his analysis was so good. I was like, I have to have a conversation, Lord willing, and, and sure enough, we're here. So the year of the Leviathan, uh, Brother Cyrus, uh, the floor is yours. Do you want to get into that? Do you want to get into some maybe some recent events? Cyrus comes to us from the state of Texas, guys. So if anyone's going to know what might really be going on over there in the state of Texas with uh, the border crisis and everything else, Cyrus is going to be a good source for us. There's so much with his military background, his background as a linguist. There's so much to cover 
Uh, what do you want to cover first, Brother Cyrus? Let me go into the cycle that's beginning. We're, we're going to be going into a cycle in the month of February. Uh, it should start about the 19th of February. Now, I used to be able to give very detailed intensity projections. I can't do that anymore. And the reason for that is um, in 2023, well, let me do it this way. Since 2020 to 2023, we had 762, the end of 2023, 762 sunspots. Now that is taking into account that 208 days of 2020 had no sunspots. And then 64 days in 2021 had no sunspots. Okay. But of that 762 sunspots between 2020 and 2023, 361 of them were in 2023. In other words, there was not a day in 2023 that there was not sunspots. Not only that, there was uh, coronal mass ejections. Some of them just absolutely phenomenal. Okay, now here we are. Uh, what is this? 29th of uh, January, 2024. And we have had about 183 sunspots so far. We have had half of the entire year of 2023. Hmm. Okay. So you cannot project what the influence of the cycle is going to be when the level of background activity far exceeds the height of the cycle itself. So what we're looking at is basically we're going, we came out of a cycle in December of 2023. Mm -hmm. There was no dip. Normally when you go through a cycle, there's a bell curve. Okay. You start out a low, you come up to a, a, a certain level. Then you go from there to another level. Then you reach your peak and then you go down to another level and down and down and, and it's gone. We have not been without um, about 60% intensity from sunspots and CMEs for over a year. So when we get a uh, particular cycle, you have no idea how, how high it's going, okay? Because the background level is already as high as most cycles were in the 20-teens and 2020, 2021. So this so, is so, a very um, uh, brother Cyrus. I just I just have one quick question for you. Okay. When you're when you're talking about the bell curve and the intensity, you're obviously your x and y axis of your chart or in your mind, right? Simplistically yes. speaking, you're just talking about background radiation, right? That's correct. Okay. Something that we did not have before. You could easily spot it and plot it on a graph. Now, you don't, you have no idea where it is because there's too much. This will persist until at least October of this year. Okay, so maybe in 2025, it will start decreasing. Now, let's talk about the cycle for just a minute, and then I'll throw some things on top of it and give you an idea of what's going in the background. Okay. okay, go for it, brother. Uh, go for it. Uh, February 19th is the beginning of the cycle. March 4th is, and this is what I'm, I'm calling it. It's an inflection point. It's a point where the uh, there is an increase taking place. Now, I can't give you a percentage because I can't calculate it, but it's inflection. Now, when the cycle is supposed to decrease, I call it a deflection going down okay i'm the only one writing about this so i get to call it whatever i want to so there we go <laughs> <laughs> let's okay. talk about that just for a moment guys so cyrus he's the one that kind of actually educated me on biblical astronomy most of what i know guys yeah it's from old books it's from bollinger it's from different works but yep. really yep. the the hands-on training that i personally received cyrus so go for it brother Okay. Yeah, no one, talk, no one talks about this. Go ahead. Okay, so going from February 19th to March 4th, we have an inflection point at March 4th. And then there will be another inflection or an increase at March 18th. 
Now the lunar eclipse takes place on the night of 24 March and the morning of 25 March. So what we have is that we have to look seven days later and that'll be basically March 31st, April 1st. That will be the peak of this cycle. Okay. So going from that to April 1st, we go to the Aleph Tav eclipse on April 8th. We're still almost in peak cycle at that time. Okay. Add seven days to April 1st. What do you get? April 8th. So we're going to be having peak cycle when this eclipse comes. But that's not the only thing coming. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is a seven year cycle from uh, uh, 2017 to 2024. For the eclipse, the original eclipse, it started August 21st, 2017. And we're going to add something to that seven years cycle as well. Uh, But that was the initiation of this Aleph Tav event. So April 15th is our first deflection point. So real, really sitting at peak intensity at April 8th. Now here's something else that happens. It just so happens it's going to occur on April 8th. And that is the devil comet. Oh boy. I haven't heard of this. Tell us. Okay. The Devil Comet is also called uh, Pons Brook. And the reason they call it the Devil Comet is because there's two horns sticking out from the comet's main mass that makes it look like, you know, a devil or a goat or whatever. This is also going to be on April 8th. And what's so unique about it and looking at where it is, And the constellations, uh, somewhere between, let me see, what is it? I don't know. Let me just say April 1st and April 15th, but April 8th is when it's going to be at at its peak. It's going to be in the pouring out of the water from the water bearer. Okay? Okay. Now, if you look at the Hebrew letter or Hebrew word, mayim, for water, Begins with an M. What does the Mem represent? It can represent uh, people, water, nations, or chaos. Okay. So all of a sudden now we have a second sign indicating chaos. Mm. All right. Mm. Then uh, we have... uh, Besides a meteor shower coming April 21st and the perihelion of the uh, uh, perihelion of the devil comet is also April 21st. That was kind of unusual. We're still in this cycle. And we see, I see two things, war and chaos. Now, it may be here. I don't know. It may be in another country, maybe Israel. It may be some renewed action in uh, whatever, uh, Ukraine, or it may be a new war somewhere. I don't know. But look at the lunar eclipse that takes place on March 24th, March 25th. It's in Western or Eastern Asia and Western Europe but it solidly hits Canada, United States, and South America. Let's take a look okay. at it. I have it right here on screen. Let me pull it up for us. Okay. Boom. Okay, this is the, again, this is the March 25th, 2024, guys. You just look, scroll down. This is from NASA's official website, gsfc.nasa.gov, and you can see what Cyrus is saying. Okay. So, really, the eclipse will be visible to far Western Africa, all of North America and South America, and 
parts of Pacific, not not a lot, but parts of the Pacific. So this is going to have a dramatic effect upon people during that period of time. Then we go into the solar eclipse on the 8th, which it only hits three countries. It hits Mexico, United States, and Canada, North America. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it'll come, it'll come ashore from the Pacific Ocean at Durango. Mazatlan, Durango area. It will go up to the Texas border at uh, Niagara's uh, Pedras. Come into Texas, just south of San Antonio. Now, it will hit San Antonio and it will go to Dallas, Fort Worth area. If you look at a map and you look at going from uh, follow I-35. Okay, I-35 goes up to San Antonio, Austin, Waco, Hillsboro, and then it splits. It goes to Fort Worth on the west, and it goes to Dallas on the east. There you go. That's the path that this uh, uh, shadow will take over Texas. Going down, now zoom out a little bit. It, yeah, zoom yeah. out a little bit. Come on some more. Okay. okay, now follow it. You see where it says Nuevo Leon, Monterey, and then Mexico City. That is the path of the Balcones fault line. Oh, it goes all the way down there. I didn't it realize It goes that. all the way to Mexico City. Mexico City is seated in the, the crater of a volcano. Right. Okay, if that everything, you know, ever reactivates, 20 million people will be dead instantly. But... Anyway, go from Mexico City, Monterey, San Antonio, Dallas, and then go through uh, part of Oklahoma, Arkansas, and then Missouri, and then right at the very tip of Illinois, it will come to Cairo, Illinois. Yeah, go up, Cairo's, Cairo's pretty okay. small. I don't know if it's going to – oh, here it is. Okay, there you go. That is where – we intersect the uh, New Madrid fault line, named after the city of New Madrid, uh, Missouri, that was destroyed in 1811, 1812, 1811 actually, uh, when the fault line opened up and the Mississippi River ran backward. Hmm. It was also so intense that uh, the church bells in Philadelphia and Boston and places like that rang because of the shaking of the earth and it continued to shake for over 20 years. Wow. Okay. That was how intense the earthquake along the new Madrid fault was. Now, let me say this right now. I am not predicting an earthquake on April 8th on Balcones fault line or the new Madrid fault line. That was one of my questions for you, but go okay. ahead. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm not predicting one. Uh, Am I going to rule it out? No, I'm just saying I'm not predicting one. Uh, you know, I know the man in charge and he hasn't told me that, so I'm not going to say that it's going to happen. Okay. I'm just saying we need to watch the effect of the eclipses and the planetary alignments this year on the crustal displacement of the earth. Okay. What I believe the Aleph Tav is is it's not the day that the United States is going to be destroyed or anything else. I believe it's a harbinger. And it is literally telling us, just like uh, Jehovah told Jeremiah, and uh, what did I say? Jeremiah 7, 16, 11, 14, and 14, 11. Okay. Stop praying for these people. The sins and abominations of America have reached the throne of Jehovah. He's not going to hear a prayer of repentance anymore. Mm. Mm. Okay. It's too late. Now, will he watch over his people? Absolutely. But he's not going to watch over the nation. Mm. So that's why I'm saying chaos and war is what I'm seeing. I also believe that we're, we're going to see heightened uh, earthquake and volcanic activity for the next two years at least. 
but that's uh, because of some other things that are going to take place in 2024. Mm -hmm. uh, the cycle should end somewhere around May 13th. Okay. But I'm telling everybody in our call and, and, and others who listen uh, to be prepared for March, April, uh, May, and June. I'm, I'm looking at, okay, January, February, March is the first quarter, and then April, May, and June is the second quarter. I'm looking for something financial to take place during that period of time. Financial okay. in by the end of Q1, beginning Q2? Q2, yes. So I am looking for something major financial to take place in the second quarter. Okay. Mm. Now, I'm trying to limit it to just this cycle, but there's so much else that is coming about. I have to move a little bit. Now sure. you showed the uh, the uh, what was it, August twenty uh, first, twenty seventeen uh, eclipse uh, taking yeah, place me, over America. Let me pull that Seven back on years screen. later, uh, not quite to the day, almost to the day. Yes, seven years later, August twenty eighth. There will be a planetary alignment that takes place. Um, let's see, I made some notes here. Where did I put it? <coughs> yeah, go for it, Cyrus. Why are you looking for that? Let me put this on screen. This just happened today. I put it inside my Telegram. Guys, Evergrande, you know, Cyrus is saying, hey, guys, watch out for uh, some sort of a financial event. This is from uh, CNN Business. Evergrande, symbol of China's property crisis, heads to liquidation that just came out today that they're starting to liquidate China's largest real estate developer, arguably one of the biggest real estate developers in the world. It's going to have major, major ripple effects in the U S guys. Yes. So I just want to point, point that one out, but go ahead, brother. Did you find the yes, planetary April alignment? 28th, April 20th, um, August 28th, August 28th, 2024. It's going to be seen in the morning just before sunrise. It's going to be Mercury, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Okay. The most important are Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. These are the four gas planets, gas giants. Okay. I personally believe that Jupiter was the second sun in our solar system. Uh, and it is now a red dwarf. And what it is composed of is metallic hydrogen and metallic helium. The same elements you'd find in our sun, but it collapsed upon itself uh, either during Noah's flood or between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2. When it says in Genesis 1-2, it says, and the earth became void and formless. So it became void and formless. So therefore, Yehovah had to rebuild it. And, you know, is that the period of the time of the, the uh, gods on earth, the false gods on earth? I believe it is. Okay. But anyway, uh, and if you look at the alignment of the planets, when you look at a sun, you should have all your planets aligned at the equator of the sun. There is only one planet that is aligned currently with the equator of the sun, and that is Mercury. All hmm. the other planets are aligned with the equator of Jupiter. Why is that? Well, I believe that was the dominant sun and it collapsed and is now just a planet. Hmm. Okay. So all of this takes place, uh, like I said, August 28th, and then we will see another realignment in October 22, uh, 22 and 23, or 23 and 24, I can't remember which, I think it's 22 and 23, which will just be the gas giants, which will be Jupiter and uh, Saturn 
and Neptune and Uranus. But uh, this is going to have a tremendous effect pulling on the outer crust of the Earth. Mm. So this could be another period of time where we need to be looking for earthquakes, volcanoes, things of that nature. But this year is going to be a very chaotic year. And it just so happens that it's Chinese New Year. The symbol is going to be the dragon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Which is the Leviathan. Or Tiamat in Egypt. You know, different, different countries had a different god of chaos. Now, one of the gods of destruction and chaos was Saturn. And the god of war was uh, Mars. On April 8th, they're going to be in the position of being in the pouring out of the water bearer. Hmm. Okay. And like I say, I believe that's an indication of chaos. And then you just happen to have the God of war and the God of destruction and chaos picking up this pouring out from the uh, water bearer. So it, it's, it's an interesting time. Now, if you go back and look at uh, E.W. Bullinger's uh, uh, book about the stars, very good book. And if you go back and look at it, and you can see that you have Aries, which is the ram, okay, of the redeemed. Pond's Brook will be between the legs of the ram going for uh, the Saturn and I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. Saturn and Mars uh, alignment. So there's a lot of things that's saying, Hey, you need to be looking at all the warnings I'm giving you. And for America, I think the Aleph Tov is the biggest warning. I think it puts us basically into that, you know, don't pray for these people anymore. I'm not going to hear their prayer. What you know, does it say in, in Proverbs 28, 9? He who turns his ear away from Torah, his prayer is an abomination to me. Okay. Yeah, brother. And and I think you just said the quiet part out loud. I, we, I've been kind of saying that on this channel, kind of hinting at it. But you're giving us the context. And I really like that because there is a time. It says, call upon me while he, you know, while I am near. Proverbs chapter one says that wisdom will mock at the calamity that comes upon people that constantly neglect and shut their ears to wisdom and constantly grieve the Holy Spirit, basically. So, guys, if you're listening to this, it's time to get right with the Lord Jesus Christ, man. It's time to get right Absolutely. with Yeshua HaMashiach. It, Absolutely. It, the door, the window of opportunity is closing, like Cyrus is saying. And so I just uh, I, I love how you brought that into really astronomical context for us, brother. I appreciate that. Anything else you wanted to bring up regarding the the celestial cycles? There's so much in here. I didn't realize you couldn't uh, pr uh, calculate the uh, intensities anymore. I had forgotten that piece. I was going to ask you about the intensities. No, it, it's not possible. You've got to have pretty much a clean slate in order to be able to determine the variation. But when the now here it's it's a good pro it's a good thing and a bad thing. OK, the bad thing is we're being bombarded by solar radiation and solar CMEs. Uh, in fact, I think we had one uh, hitting us today that caused a blackout of certain shortwave frequencies. OK, uh, primarily in the southern hemisphere, uh, Australia and places in the southern hemisphere. But uh, we're having so much solar uh radiation bombarding the earth that it's kind of like um, a shield to a certain extent Th when the sun is in this type of cycle because of the intensity of the radiation it blocks radiation from outside of our solar system which can be more harmful than the radiation coming from the sun so it is protecting us at the same time it's causing big variations in what's going on on the earth. 
there's been several CMEs so far this year. Uh, one just a few days ago was so powerful that it blew part of the atmosphere away off the top of Venus. Okay. We are, uh, Venus and Mars are directly opposite of us in their position to the sun right now. So we missed that event. Praise Yah. Okay. Or it could have damaged our atmosphere. Probably could have damaged a lot of uh, sophisticated electronics as well. So, yeah, actually, I, I was going to ask you about that, Cyrus. You know, whenever I hear of coronal mass ejection CME events, usually it's kind of what looks like a sensational headline from different media outlets saying, oh, right. wires and homes can overheat and things can get fried. What do you have to say about that? Is that true? Can it get so intense that electronics can be compromised? Yes, it, it can. Uh, and you go back to the Carrington event, I think it was 1848, 1849. The only electronic thing we had in existence at that time was the telegraph system, and it caused telegraph systems to melt, the wires melted, started brush fires and forest fires, things of that nature. But uh, it is a real phenomenal, uh, phenomena that is observable, and we're overdue for another one. So it could happen at any time. And I'm not saying, you know, it's going to happen tomorrow or anything like that. But a lot of scientists are watching for it. Uh, the uh, idea of getting hit by an X-class flare, which is the highest class of flare, uh, even an X-1 could destroy satellites in space. You just overload them and they would burn up. Wow. Then your, you know, all your GPS and things of that nature, uh, air traffic control, things of that nature are gone. Communications, uh, you know, worldwide would be gone. So there's, it is a real danger. Um, how big would one take to shut down everything on earth and send us back to the 19th century? I would say probably an X5. Mm -hmm. uh, some say an X10. I don't believe it would take that much because we have unshielded electronics. We are, even our electrical system is unshielded. So um, we could shield our electrical system for about the cost of three uh, B, B3, B2 bombers, B2 bombers. Uh, I think it would be about $3 billion. We could fix our electrical system to protect it. But unfortunately, they're worried about uh, the homeless illegal aliens coming in and making sure they have a $3,000 credit card and all this other no, stuff. Wait, so, wait, those are old numbers, Cyrus. It's 5,000 now. Oh, is it 5,000? 5, 5,000. Okay. 5, yeah. Yeah. Some yeah. reports are coming in. Yeah. I told my oh, wife man. that uh, we need to go ahead and cross the border and swim across the river and make a little money. <laughs> <laughs> Beats retirement, right? Yeah, exactly. It's better than, it's better than social security for most Americans. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Cyrus, my goodness, you've given us a lot to talk about already. Let's talk more about Leviathan. Why are you saying it's Leviathan? I just want to pull this on screen. Guys, right now, again, the Chinese Zodiac, we don't promote this, okay? We're not trying to promote a Chinese narrative. We're Hebrew guys here. We follow the God of the Bible. We're just saying, coincidentally, it is the year of the dragon and the Chinese Zodiac, which the Chinese are a billion people on the planet, so that's obviously very important from that consciousness point of view. And then, of course, you know, the, the dragon, you, you said it's synonymous with chaos, right, Cyrus? That's correct. That is yeah. correct. And we see that uh, numerous scriptures uh, all the way to Revelation tell us about the dragon and the evil that the dragon does. And we see there in Revelation 12 where the dragon is thrown out of heaven and brings a third of the stars with him. And so that's already happened. So we have this presence on the earth, uh, demonic, well, not demonic, angelic uh, presence, demons. Oh, I, I like that. I like yeah. that distinction. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Well, fallen angels are devils. Okay. They are represented as serpents and demons are represented as scorpions. So when Yeshua said to his disciples, I give you power over 
serpents and scorpions. He's not talking about dancing around with a rattlesnake in Tennessee in a Baptist church. He's talking about having power over fallen angels and demons. Mm. Okay. That's what he's talking about. I got to show you this, Cyrus. I got to show. So I looked up the word Leviathan, Livyathan in the mm -hmm. Hebrew. You look at the Strong's. Here's what I found interesting: dragon producing eclipses. I've never seen that before. I just, <laughs> I just thought it's interesting with today's talk that that's one of the nuances of the Hebrew word. And we do have, you know, this chaos that's unfolding. Yes. Um, I, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, but I definitely have some questions for you. Uh, and just Ask to get your away. perspective. Okay. Cool. Cool. Oh man, I've been I've been so excited to get you on again, Cyrus, because you of all people that I know just bring a ton of analysis and insight from your own personal background into what's happening with World War III, with what's happening with Iran, Russia, China. So from your perspective, if you had to choose between let, let's just talk about the top three, right? The big three, Iran, Russia, or China. Which country would you say is going to cause World War III to accelerate the fastest in 2024 and why? Oh, man, that's like trying to pick the, the three fastest runners on the planet and then figure out which one's going to win their next race. Uh, I, I'll, I'll give you a hint. Last week, President Vladimir Putin, president of uh, Russia, gave a speech in which he said that the deal between the United States and Russia for the sale of Alaska was fraudulent. Now Russia wants his property back. Okay. Now, I think in our first interview, I told you about this KGB defector that brought the plan with him in his head. And that plan was for to uh, Russia or Soviet Union to fake a collapse. Mm. And then Russia would look vulnerable. And then at some point in time around 2020, Russia and China would form a coalition. And sometime after that, they would go to defeat the United States. I believe that's still the plan. Okay. And this little off key comment by Vladimir Putin, we want our property back. Well, that sounds like we stole it. So they have a legitimate claim to Alaska. But uh, his first name was Stanislav. I, it was not Lunev. Lunev came in the 1980s or 90s. I cannot remember the man's name. But anyway, he said that uh, Russia would take Alaska and Canada and China would take the United States and Mexico. Okay. So what China has to have with over 1 billion people it has to have a place where it can grow enough food to feed those people to keep them from having a revolution. Hmm. Okay, go back hmm. to Arab Spring, back, what was that, 2011. That was caused by the price of uh, wheat flour going up and people couldn't afford it. So countries were overthrown, uh, most famously Egypt, but also Morocco, Tunisia, and Libya were overthrown because people rebelled against the high price of wheat because it was subsidized by the government. Hmm. What would happen here if uh, the government couldn't subsidize uh, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, welfare, things of that nature? Or if they did subsidize it and they gave you $3,000, $5,000 a month, but a cup of coffee was 6000 what good would it do you? OK, so you have to stop and look at the the nature of inflation, things of that. Uh, all of this is going into this potentially powerful financial cycle somewhere in the second quarter. Wow. OK, so. Oh, my goodness. Basically, so from your from your view, the astronomical evidence doesn't necessarily indicate, OK, this is the one whether Russia, China, or Iran, there's, it's not really clear yet, right? It's not really clear, but here's, this is my gut feeling. Uh, Russia and China will come together, just like we talked about in that one interview where I showed you the maps. Right. Russia will take care of the East Coast and Alaska, and China will take care of uh, the main part of uh, 
of United States. I believe that uh, Iran will participate to some degree, but I believe too that Iran is going to be used to uh, distract America from what's about to come, and so will North Korea. I believe North Korea will make a move on South Korea, and Iran will make a very bold move against Israel. Hmm. That will distract the United States to fight a three-front war. We're still engaged in Ukraine. Then we would be engaged in the Middle East even more heavily than we are. And then all of a sudden, uh, China goes after Taiwan. We're fighting three fronts. You can't do that. You can't even fight a two-front war. Not only that, I told you about the rope-a-dope, and I, I've been proven correct many times over that Russia is doing what it's doing to cause us to run out of ammunition and the ability to defend ourselves. So we're being yeah. rope doped You have been proven 100% right about that. Again, guys, I put it on screen for just a moment. If you didn't catch episode 11, I stopped numbering the episodes of Overcome Babylon because it just became too numerous, but go back to the very beginning. We, I had Cyrus on, and that information that was presented is as relevant as ever. If, if anything, what we're talking about today is really part two of the analysis. Now that we're really digging deeper into what's next, we, a bunch has already happened. And for again, for those of you who don't know, Cyrus, uh, he enlisted into the Air Force uh, uh, rather than being drafted, right? You just yes. decided to enlist. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I got my draft notice and I thought, hey, I'm going to be real smart. I'm going to join the Air Force and I won't have to worry about that. And then they made me a Vietnamese linguist and sent me to guess where, you know? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, so through all that experience, you, you eventually were recruited by the NSA. You worked as a linguist. I was recru but, recruited by NSA two weeks into basic training. Amazing. That's so cool. Yeah. And um, so they trained you up in Arabic, you know, 12 different dialects of Arabic. Yes, correct. <laughs> That's amazing. And so here, here's one thing I really want to, I wanted to get your opinion on, your view on, especially with your unique background. So for those that don't know, uh, Iran had a revolution and I, I forget the years. It was 1978 to 1979. There was the Iranian revolution. And up until that point, Iran had a monarchy, you know, kings. Or... That was the Persian, that was the Persian empire. Oh, okay? okay. Now the Persian empire collapsed in 1979-1980. And if you'll go back to Mene, Mene, Tekel, Upharsin, uh -huh. which is the prophecy, of, and also remember the tree that was cut down, a band of iron and a band of bronze was put around the stump. Okay, that is the prophecy of the resurrection of, or the destruction of the Persian Empire, which took place uh, and let's, let's call it 1980. I think that's the official date really the took place date. in 79. But if you go back and look at it, it matches the, the math comes out perfect. When you match up, main a, main a, tackle you farce. That, that's numbers hmm. in Hebrew. Okay. When you put those numbers together, you come up with the year 1980. Whoa. Okay. So there was like a, there's like a three dimensional prophecy loaded into Daniel. In every chapter in every chapter of Daniel. Yes, that's correct. Wow. So it's, it's, um, I mean, what can I say? It's there. It, it sticks out like a sore thumb. Uh, and when you look at, uh, uh, the prophecy of the statue, there's prophecy underneath that prophecy. Okay. Mm. So it's a multi-dimensional deal and you should be able to find um you should be able to find a minimum of two levels of prophecy in each one but some of them have at least three levels okay 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 wow and so what was your so you were actually there to kind of witness the iranian revolution i have a specific question about that but what was your yeah. before we get to that what was your general role there uh, if, I, can you well, talk about later it on, later it on? Class, I became go the go between between uh, the United States government and the people that were holding the hostages. They were not Iranian; they were Palestinian. The leader of the group in the the uh, United States embassy was the brother of one of my professors, so they accepted me as a go between 
uh, spokesperson uh, in that exchange. And we, we got some concessions out of them because I knew how to embarrass them. And so they, they released 13 hostages because I, you know, said, hey, it's, it's easy to, you know, look like a tough guy when you just take a bunch of women. And uh, I used the race car, too, and blacks who had been slaves in America. So, And so they released the women and the uh, blacks uh, from the embassy. But one Marine, a black Marine, said, no, I'm staying with my comrade. So he would, he would not accept freedom. He stayed there. Mm. And so my, my admiration went to him immediately. But, yes, I, I was in communication. Wow. My goodness. And we also helped the Shah get out and go from uh, Iran to Egypt. Uh, and then and from the, Egypt, the, Shah, the Shah is the title of the monarch. Right? That's correct. Okay. Yeah. Shah and the Shahrani. The Shahrani is his wife. Uh, she was a princess, Princess Faradiba. So, so, so for those that don't know, uh, again, I, I don't know how to say his name. How do you say the current... Supreme leader, the Ayatollah of Iran. How do you say his name? Is it Khamenei? Khamenei is what I call him. I don't know. Khamenei. My, nick, I yeah, you know. my nickname for him is the Khamenei. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The Khamenei. <laughs> yeah. Right. And so yeah. he, ever since the Iranian Revolution, which, so again, Iran had been a monarchy for over a thousand years. Then all of a sudden they became a theocratic system with a president. So it's like pseudo democratic, but it's like you got the supreme leader that's been installed for uh, a few decades now yep. since 19, 1979. Um, They've had more than one, though. Uh, the Ayatollah Khomeini, hmm. Khomeini was the original uh, leader. And see, this was an operation that took place between NSA and CIA. CIA w was the one who reinstalled or, or installed Ayatollah Khomeini. Khomeini was um, in Paris in exile, and the CIA brought him out of exile and brought him to Iran, which was running against what NSA was trying to do. NSA and CIA do not get along, mm. okay? There's always a fight, competition between them. They're trying to compete for money, uh, mm. and, you know, NSA does not have the money let's say the back pocket that uh, CIA does in drugs and prostitution, things of that nature. Well, so here's my big question for you, Cyrus, and I want you to educate us because I've heard different narratives about what happened in Iran, and now we see what it has become. It's become the arch enemy of the West. Was the United States government involved with the overthrow of the monarchy of Iran? It was involved in the establishment of the monarchy in Iran through uh, the Shah's father, and it was involved in the overthrow. Yes. So would you say that Ibrahim Raisi and the current establishment there is somehow working with dark elements of the United States government to actually carry out some of the things that are happening in the Middle East in some sort of a twisted way? Yes, absolutely. Because I, I, I can't seem to put my finger on what's going on. Absolutely. It's... It's, it's there's so many examples I could give you. It, it's just unbelievable. But yes, the CIA normally sponsors our our enemy uh, because that serves their you know their agenda. Who trained uh, Fidel Castro? The CIA. Who trained Che Guevara? CIA. Mm -hmm. Where did they train them? Down in Algiers, Louisiana, down in the swamp, down there at a Halliburton facility. Hmm. Okay. So yes, the CIA is always raising up the next bad guy so they can utilize it to get more funds uh, when it comes time for appropriations. Hmm. Hmm. Ukraine hmm. is not the only corrupt government in the world. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, it'd be nice if it were, right? Just one yeah. government corrupt in the yeah. world. <laughs> one, one thing to worry about. But yeah, um, it's I just I've, I've never understood all of the three dimensional chess of what goes on with the bureaucracies, man. It's just so hard to even understand from a civilian's point of view. Um, so I thought I'd ask you and you definitely confirmed that for me. So I appreciate that. Now I have a little bit more, I guess, of a navigation system as I'm going through all of these headlines and all these 
you know, all these news stories. And that's really what I want for everybody who's listening is guys, listen to what Cyrus is saying. Uh, this, you know, like this is raw. This is, uh, you know, his experience mixed with this just the way it is. Like, it's just plain as day. In fact, you look at Fidel Castro and you look at Justin Trudeau and they even look alike. I mean, they look yeah. like relatives. Uh, how look suspicious at, uh, is that? <laughs> Mitchell McNeely there in the chat, just like we did in Iraq. Uh, yes, it, it's exactly correct. Um, yeah. Yeah. During yeah. 1980, going into 81, the United States promised uh, Saddam Hussein all the ammunition, all the um, weapons of mass destruction, all the chemical weapons he wanted if he would go to war with Iran. Hmm. And so he did. And we supplied him with those weapons. That's why when we went in, we said we were looking for weapons of mass destruction. Well, why did we think he had them? Because we sold them to him out of a toy company in, uh, I think it was Tampa, Florida, that sold these weapons to Saddam Hussein to fight Iran for us. Hmm. Okay. And then after he did the same thing Muammar Gaddafi tried to do, which was to go to a gold-backed currency system, we thought, oh, we can't do that. And the whole thing about taking over Kuwait and stuff, that, that was, that was theater. Uh, it's a long story and I can't, I don't have time to go into it. <laughs> right. Well, I'm sure you have a lot to say, but basically what you're saying is Hussein, uh, uh who was the other guy? Uh, Qaddafi or Omar, Omar Qaddafi. These yeah. guys were, these guys were disposed of when they were no longer useful and they're no longer following orders basically. Right. Yes, exactly. When they started going against what we wanted, then we went in and took him out, just like Bashar al-Assad. Okay, Bashar al-Assad is a good man. Okay, he's a humanitarian. He's not the boogeyman that America makes him out to be. He's a pediatrician by training. Okay, mm -hmm. Bashar al-Assad would not go along with allowing a pipeline to go across Syria, go into Turkey, and then go into Southern Europe, which the UAE wanted to install and we wanted the uae to get it and he hmm. said no well you can't hmm. say no uh, and expect the united states government to not do something so they tried to depose him and the russians stepped in and said not on our watch you know because so, of conflict of interest right right because syria is tremendously important to russia it's where the sub pins are and they have a warm water port Mm -hmm. So it, it's a very important place for them, uh, you know, on the Mediterranean Sea. Right, right. And uh, I've showed a few graphics and images here in the podcast of how Syria is just chopped up in all these bases and different. You got Iranian yeah. bases, American bases. <laughs> yeah, it, it's an it's a mess. And I made a joke one time. I was like, this is what happens when you're a country that doesn't have nuclear weapons. You just basically become a landing strip and a seaport for everybody else. Pretty much. Uh, if you're in the Middle East and you don't have nuclear weapons. Um, well, Cyrus, that brings me to something else. Um, how? Let me ask you this while we're still talking about Syria, and then I want to jump over to Egypt and what's going on with the Suez Canal and some, some stuff over there. But Syria, Syria, Syria. How do you think that the Damascus prophecy of Isaiah chapter 17 is going to be fulfilled? Do you, do you, do you see it the way kind of I'm seeing it? And if not, that's totally fine. I mean, that's why we're having the conversation, but the way I'm kind of seeing it is Israel's going to be outnumbered, outgunned. They're going to do something really reckless, like launch tactical nukes in the direction of Hezbollah, uh, those military bases there that we just mentioned, those Iranian and Russian bases, and they're going to hit Damascus and wipe it out. And then, then that day, Isaiah 17 says, Jacob's cities will become forsaken, like a forsaken bow. What's your take on all that? That could be, uh, uh, and, and I think it, it's a very probable scenario, but if you've seen pictures of Damascus lately, it's already starting to look like a ruined heap, okay? Uh, it wouldn't take too much more shelling to, you know, turn it into a ruined heap. But it, it could be uh, something along a, a low-yield nuclear weapon. Uh, but when you do that, like I said, Syria is vitally important to Russia. Hmm. So if you attack Syria in that way, then uh, I, Russia is going to reciprocate. Well, so don't you that, think? 
Uh huh. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I'm just going to say, you know, uh, Russia's got far more nukes than Israel does. You know, I think probably, you know, Israel has somewhere between 200 and 300 nukes, but Russia has more nukes than we do. So, mm. and not only that, their nukes are newer and better than ours are. Right. And I'm just, I'm just putting that graphic that I always share on screen of just those Iranian and Russian bases. You got the seaport in the north that's kind of cut off on the screen, but you got yeah. Tardis, Hamamim. And I was going to ask you, Cyrus, um, don't you think that Iran, though, would also retaliate? I mean, let's just, you know, let's just get it off the table. Does Iran not have nukes? They they have nukes, Oh, right? yeah. Yeah. They've probably had nukes for about 10 years now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. This yeah. idea that they're going to have them in two weeks has been going on for 10 years. Hmm. Okay. Uh, and I'd say- I, You know, what? I noticed that. I noticed yeah. that in my research. They keep recycling the same headline. Oh, they're two yeah. weeks away. Oh, they're two. I'm like, wait a minute. This is from 2000. 12 what is this yep. <laughs> exactly no i believe they've had them since uh at least 12 yes but i'm just going to say at least 10 years um the iranians are very very smart i mean very smart people i've known many iranian engineers at the super collider when i was there at the super collider um and self-sacrificing hard-working people but mm. uh, as far as exactly how it's going to happen uh I don't know, but uh, Iran could get uh, very, uh, let's just use PO'd and uh, start lobbying nukes. And remember, uh, Israel's a tiny nation. And, uh, you know, you would have to use a tactical nuke in order to not harm your, your allies mm. if you wanted to do any damage in Israel. So... Yeah. I have a feeling, and this is just my gut feeling, I think they're going to use uh, neutron bombs and do it that way. That way it won't destroy the infrastructure. It'll just kill the people and animals. Mm. Mm -hmm. Which, which, if that, that makes a lot of sense to me because that allows a lot of other prophecies on the back end of the destruction of Jerusalem and so forth to be fulfilled. You know, it can't be completely wiped out. And people ask me that question all the time. Well, if is if you keep saying that the West is going to fall, United States, but Israel also, and there's going to be nukes, everything's going to be wiped out. There's going to be no more prophecy ever fulfilled. It's like, guys, listen to what Cyrus is saying right now. There's different yeah. types of weapons out there. <laughs> oh, definitely. We had, we developed a neutron bomb in uh, oh the late seventies. I want to say it was seventy seven, seventy eight, and uh, when President Carter found out how it operated. He uh, forbid the construction of the bomb. He allowed the the uh, engineers to build the components, but not to assemble it because it was just meant to kill people and not destroy. Suppose, let's just call it the battlefield. Mm -hmm. OK, mm -hmm. so it was in, the intention was to kill just people and not, uh, quote, the battlefield. Right. So we've had those parts sitting in storage since the 1970s. Russia mm -hmm. had no president do that. So I'm sure they assembled theirs and uh, they're probably quite willing to use it. And guess what? They kill all the people, uh, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Portland, Seattle, but the infrastructure is still there. All you have to do is wait two weeks for the radi radiation to subside. And then you can walk in and take over the place. Hmm. And Just sweep out the corpses. Yeah, guys, nuclear war isn't the end of the world. It's just the no. end of certain population centers. That's and that's why I, I keep telling everybody, hey, guys, move it to the country. It's not a bad idea. But if God wants you to be in the city, man, hey, you know, he's got a purpose for you. And that's between you and him. Fine. I'm not getting in the way of that. But generally speaking, as a general rule of thumb, hey, being in the country ain't a bad idea. Right, Cyrus? Right. Absolutely. Now, guys, listen, I, I want to get Cyrus's take on this. Cyrus, if you guys didn't know, he was involved in the in the Sinai Peace Oh, what's it called again? Sinai Peace Treaty. Uh, yeah, the, right. Uh -huh. And it, it was eventually later known as the Camp David Accords. Um, basically, there was a there was kind of a historic peace deal through the Carter administration back in those days, ushered between Egypt and Israel. And what? Here's my question, Cyrus, because we know what's been happening lately. There's what's called the BRICS Ten Alliance. It used to just yeah. be Brazil, India, China, Russia, okay, <laughs> South Africa, South, but now South Africa, right. all of a sudden <clears throat> it just expanded into this huge power block uh, encompassing almost half the world's population. You have all these nations, but one yes. of them is Egypt. 
Yes. Do you feel? Do you feel that the what had been accomplished in those days of the peace deal of the Carter administration? Do you feel like that was overturned with BRICS? And do you feel like that's why Israel has been trying to create and foment a refugee crisis to destabilize Egypt? What's your take on that? I say that that is probably a good uh, a good assessment. <clears throat> As long as we were paying Egypt a billion dollars a year and uh, supplying them with arms and ammunition, if you look, they have a very modern army and air force that we built for them. They have M1 Abrams tanks. They have F-16, F-22 uh, fighters. I don't think they have F-35s yet. That's probably a good thing for them. But uh, they have a massive army. The problem is, as when they uh, Hosni Mubarak was the vice president under uh, Anwar Sadat, and he was a pretty good president uh, overall for Egypt. Uh, of course, you know, like anybody in that part of the world, he profited handsomely, but still the people did too. And the, uh, the army benefited tremendously. In fact, I was supposed to go to work uh, on the Nile River project in the 1994 or five, the company I was working for was a DOE contractor. And, uh, but unfortunately we didn't get the labor part of the contract. We just got the parts and supply. But uh, anyway, um, it was a very good deal, but I think our money ran out in uh, 2002, if I remember correctly, it hmm. seemed like it was a 25 year deal. Uh, and, that left a, a deficit in Egypt. Mubarak was overthrown during the Arab Spring by the Muslim Brotherhood, which is a radical arm. And now the the president seems to be kind of even-handed, but he's not taking any baloney off the United States. So mm. uh, <clears throat> how that's going to work out, I really don't know. But I know that they have already definitively stated we're not going to take over the refugee problem. Right, it's, right. Because Israel wants to push all the uh, Palestinians in Sinai. Right. And so it's it's been well documented. I don't know if you probably do agree, just because I know you the way you an, an analyze data, and uh, I haven't necessarily gotten your take, but you, you do you agree that the, Israel deliberately stood down on October 7th? Yes. Yeah, so... So then we're in agreement on that. So it's like, okay, why? And so that that a series of questions gets asked. I know I kind of jumped for everybody who's listening, but it looks to uh, it looks to me like they're trying to destabilize Egypt, and that was the real motive behind all the stuff that's going on. Um, thanks for shedding a little light on that. I didn't realize that the money ran out in two thousand two. I think it that, was two uh, two thousand two, if I'm not mistaken. Well, that makes sense because that was after you know uh, the dot com crash. Uh, yes. There's a lot bailouts in those days. And now, I mean, the dollar's at the end of its rope and everybody's looking for alternatives. Everybody's jumping on the bricks, you know, beasts, the horse of bricks, whatever you want to call it. Everybody's jumping on that train and ditching yes. the dollar. So I don't know if you have any more thoughts on that, but I, I, I definitely appreciate your, your feedback on that. <laughs> well, bricks is going to become an energy powerhouse. You already have the, U, uh, the UAE, Saudi Arabia, and Russia are members of BRICS plus, and, you know, Russia is the number three oil producer in the world. Saudi Arabia is number two and we're number one, or we were before the Biden administration. Uh, but our deposits are, you know, my dad told me many years ago, he was in the oil field. He said, there's enough uh, oil in America to run us for 200 years. And, you know, that's a lot of oil. Um, and they've got everybody believing this man-made climate change. And uh, to that, I just have one thing to say. The Arctic poles are melting on Earth. That's documented. But they're melting on Mars as well. So does that mean that Martians are using coal-fired power plants and using gasoline-powered UFOs? Apparently no, it's a solar cycle, <laughs> a cycle, right? Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Well, Cyrus, oh my goodness. I Thanks for sharing that. I had no clue about these types. I mean, when it comes to space and astronomy, man, I'm still a rookie. We didn't even look, we're kind of out of time, brother. I don't know if you want to stick around just for, for a second. We didn't even talk about the border. Uh, this is from CBS Austin. Uh, there's a, a, a trucker convoy, apparently. I don't know how real this is. I haven't seen footage yes. necessarily. Tell us about it, uh, Cyrus, since you live in Texas. What's going on with the trucker uh, blockades? Uh, I think it left today. It left out of Virginia today. Now, there's people also coming from California as well. They're estimating that there will be about 700,000 vehicles. That'll be 18-wheelers and pickup trucks and uh, motorcycle uh, clubs and things of that nature. But they're saying that there should be about 700,000 vehicles converge on Eagle Pass uh texas and then What's from your... there they'll go oh. to uh yuma arizona and from there they go to i think they said san isidro california i'm not sure what's what's your analysis of what's going to happen here do you think there's going to be a some kind of a flashpoint some kind of a staged terror event i mean we don't even know who's been coming through the border do you think something is going to go wrong here what's your what's your gut feeling on all this i think it's inevitable i think it's inevitable there's been uh, tens of thousands of military age, single men, unaccompanied men coming into the United States and being flown to whatever city they want to go to. And uh, I saw a video I saw that. Uh, I saw made that. Yeah, by a Chinese man who went to the gun range in a new car, pulled out two very beautiful, one handgun, one rifle, and was hitting dead center every time. So, uh, you know, that's, you know, he'd only been here two weeks. where did he get the money? Hmm. I mean, those two guns together would have been more than $5,000. So, hmm. you know, anyway, I believe that the networks have been set up here for many years. And at some point in time, a call will go out and everybody will do what they've been told to do. Hmm. Hmm. Well, you only, they... you only have 12 transformer stations to blow up in this country to shut the whole country down. Okay. Now, Texas does have at least one hardened transformer station about uh, 30 miles north of me. So that's one thing I know because it, I saw it. I, I saw it being, uh, on a highway and oh, wow. uh, I recognized it and I thought, hey, look what we've got. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny that you could identify that. I wouldn't know what to look for. Um, it, yeah. Anyway, I know I know most of the transformers, most of the technology I've heard. Parts have to be sourced overseas. If we were to have to replace them, it would take years. 18 to 24 months each. Okay, there you go, guys. So, hey, look, it's not a bad idea to, uh, you know, have water stored up because most of us rely on electricity to pump water, to have water Correct. brought to your house or whatever. Have water storage, uh, food storage, these types of things, because like we're saying, guys, it's a flashpoint. Something could be something doesn't smell right with this whole trucker thing, guys. Why are people getting so angry about the border now? We're in yeah. almost an election season. Like, why are people getting so angry now? Why didn't they care when Biden just got into office? Why now? And so something doesn't smell right. And I, right, Cyrus? Absolutely. Remember the rule of three. OK, when you go into well, it used to be taught in the military back in the 60s and 70s. You can go three minutes without air, three days without water and three weeks without food. So which ones do you need to start with first? OK, so most of us depend on the air that we breathe without any protection. You might want to think about some protection, but water. When you go beyond three days, your body's still functioning, but it's robbing liquid from major organs of the body, especially the skin. Remember, that's the largest organ in your body. That's right. Uh, dehydration causes, you know, brain fog and everything else. So uh, you store one gallon of water per person per day. And I would have a minimum now storing it. Maybe you have a water well that you can hand pump it or pump with a windmill or run a generator and pump it. Okay. It's stored, stored in the ground for you. Otherwise, and here in our home, we have many, many gallons of stored water, but we also have, uh, access to water mm -hmm. should it be cut off 
So uh, you, you want to have a minimum of 90 days, okay? Food, uh, uh, we have at least three years here and three years in New Mexico. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it just depends on how many people join us in New Mexico. Right. But, uh, you know, if we're caught in New Mexico when all this goes down, we'll have to just write this off. Vice versa, if we're caught here when all this goes down, we just have to write what's off in New Mexico. Uh, because only a fool would try to write, drive through cities where people are protesting. You know, you'll, you'll make it through the first small town and that's about it. You know, people that are desperate are going to take you out. Yeah, I agree, man. So that's again, why it's good to be in the country to begin with. It's hard work. It's a different lifestyle. It's inconvenient, but that's, that's, that's part of survival. It's like a, it's like a trade-off, right? Right. You have to you have to balance the here and now with the future and balance it in a way that makes sense for your spouse, for your family. And I think if you guys just follow some of these simple tips that Cyrus is giving tonight, you'll be well, well equipped for what's coming uh, in a massive way, which, again, this is why we're doing what we're doing now. I will say this because I want to respect your time, uh, Brother Cyrus. I say, hey, you know, let's do an hour together. Obviously, we could go much longer. I didn't even we didn't even get a chance to talk about these types of topics. I want to talk about A.I., you know, what's your what's your thoughts on AI starting nuclear war? I wanted to talk about maybe uh, the fact that people are talking about brain chips, uh, new bioweapons. There's all kinds of stuff in the news at all hours of the day. But guys, suffice it to say that we are in a crazy cycle, like our brother said. Um, it is time to get right with our maker. I was talking in my prayer closet recently. He's like, just draw closer to me than never, never before and you'll be fine. That's an easy, easy, light burden. That's an easy yoke. Our master just wants us to spend time with him, guys. How how hard is that? Absolutely. And as long as we are intimate with him, if that's all he wants. And the whole point of judgment is for God's people to draw near to him. So I don't know if you have any closing comments, Cyrus. Not really. I think we've pretty well covered uh, the high points. Is what, uh, I know the people here in Texas take the border seriously. Uh, even people who immigrated here and got their citizenship, um, uh, Hispanics and, and others. And you got to understand uh, the relationship to uh, Texas and uh, the Spanish history of Texas. And so all of this is very important to us. Our heroes that fought at the Alamo that were Hispanic also captain seguin and all his men who fought at the battle of san jacinto when texas won its independence these men are are memorialized and captain seguin has a city named after him and garza has a county named after him and all these people have memories for people that uh, are familiar with texas history so we we're not looking down and saying we don't want these mexicans here that's not what we're saying we want them to do it legally. That's what we want. And, you know, in our little town here, uh, there, you know, we're talking about 500 people. We have numerous Hispanic families and they're an integral part of our community. And, you know, I've watched these kids. Well, I knew, you know, when our mothers were pregnant, I knew, <laughs> you know, this, we've known them that long. And now they're an integral part of our community. We just love it. And uh, that's what makes a, a totally a real, a real diverse community. OK, right. when you have different groups of people coming together, working together to make the community better. OK, so no, in Texas, we do not uh, uh, look down on immigrants at all. Uh, but even the local people, uh, Hispanics, who have gone the legal route don't want to see these people come in because that cheapens their accomplishment. It really does. And like, well, yeah, it cheapens all of ev- our quality of life, everything. Because like you said, like we were joking around about, they're getting $3,000 a month on a preloaded debit card. Yeah. Uh, they're being flown. There, there was a whistleblower by Sinclair. I believe her name was, there was some whistleblower who put something on X on Twitter and she was showing all these immigrants getting or illegals being flown around uh, by you. Was it United Airlines or American Airlines? But they're just being flown around. There's these big lines of undocumented people. And it's it's part of a bigger agenda. 
it's called the UN. It's called, you know, all these secret agencies and different, different, yes, you know, it's the WEF really at the end of the day is what it is yeah. and all that. So, but Don't yeah, brother. Believe for a minute that uh, somebody in the government, whether, you know, it's from a particular agency or just a rogue element uh, will try to use anything, uh, you know, a bomb, anything to cause uh, one, a distraction. Hmm. Because when something like that happens, everybody's focused on it and they forget about what's going on around them. So it's easy to do things behind you when you're not paying attention. So like I always tell people, if you see something happen over here, look around, start looking mm -hmm. around where it's going to come from, because that big element, uh, that big thing that took place uh, was just a distraction. That's it, brother. Well, guys, our time has expired here with Brother Cyrus. Thank you for being here with us for so long. We have 71 days until April 8th. We're not saying it's the end of the world. We're just saying be situationally aware, which is exactly what Cyrus just finished telling us. So God bless you, Cyrus. If if, if we're still around and we're st we still have internet and there's no CME event or anything crazy, maybe we'll have you back on the podcast if you're up for it because your insights are amazing. Thank you again so much for being here with us. Brother Thank Cyrus. you. Thank you for having me. Well, God bless you guys. Uh, I, you know, we didn't have time for questions or anything like that today. No Q and A's, but um, check out the live on Wednesday, Friday, coming at you again, every single week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Hope to see you guys there. God bless you. Be prepared guys. And just don't slack off right now with your relationship with God. All right. Pray Absolutely. in the prayer closet, get intimate with God. That's all he desires of us guys. Really simple. All right, Cyrus. God bless you guys. We'll Shalom. see you. Shalom, guys. Have a good night. Thank you. You soon return